I did it not just for people with, uh, who already believed in historic preservation, but people who uh, were in a position to affect community change, developers, uh, citizens. The book I wrote was um, a success in the sense that it reached a, uh, an, a, uh, an audience that had not um, previously thought about this. I'd like to turn to another thing. Uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, there's a public radio program. Perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, what do you know? Uh, they invite people from the audience at one point. Um, how many of you have listened to What Do You Know? Okay. Well, it's, it's broadcast from the Monona Terrace Convention Center. Um, at one point in that program, uh, Michael Feldman asked someone to come out of the audience and to throw a dart at, uh, at a map. The map is cut up into pieces, so you can't really see. It's the United States, but it's in a configuration that you would never be able to recognize, and so you can't aim that dart at anything in particular. Um, and someone comes and throws that dart, and where it hits is the town of the week, the next week. And so the next week, they call somebody up to talk about their town. And um, people are called, and they often find something good to say about their community. Some of the places that are called are pretty ordinary places, um, not terribly special. But it's interesting to me how people always want to find something good to say about the community that they're living in, um, and to find something good in it, and to uh, make it sound interesting, even though, really, some of these places are pretty ordinary. Um, and in fact, uh, many people are engaging in a kind of wishful thinking um, that, in fact, their communities are special. Uh, and some of these places are really pretty ordinary. The nub of the problem, really, it seems to me, is that people want their communities to be special. They want them to have unique qualities, but they haven't been willing to engage in the kind of planning and uh, collective processes to make them so. Um, as Peter Hall observed, planning in America is almost a contradiction in terms. We have a great resistance to planning, and it seems to have deepened over the course of uh, uh, this last couple decades. And the signs of a lack of planning are everywhere uh, in our landscape. We can see sprawl consuming farmland and open space, endless strip development, communities without centers. Um, the fact is that many communities are becoming more and more alike. And when you travel from one place to another, except for regional variations in topography, uh, it's, some, it's becoming increasingly difficult to find special places. Having worked in this field for some 30 years, I know that planning can make a difference in communities. And I've read enough to know how plans have influenced um, the shape and formation of cities. But there have been precious few books really to communicate that to a broad audience. There are planning histories that tell you more than you want to know about communities and more details and facts and names. Um, but they don't really tell a storyline that resonates to people um, to convince them that it maybe is worth supporting planning. So it seemed to me that some other approach needed to be taken. And I needed to make a practical case for people to believe in planning, they have to believe that it produces qualities and attributes that they value and that they want to see in their own communities, and that planning makes a difference. So I decided to try to identify sp specific communities and to show how planning had created qualities and characteristics that people in those communities valued, that they thought were good things that had happened, and to try to reconstruct how those things had happened. Had they happened by accident? Um, had they, or they, was there some uh, deliberate process? With the help of the staff of the American Planning Association in Chicago, I uh, sent out a survey to people who were members of the American Planning Association for 10 years or more. And I asked them to identify communities that had been positively shaped by planning, uh, and then to identify and describe the qualities that, and uh, outcomes that they associated 
with planning, that they felt that planning had helped to bring about. I also asked them to describe some of the qualities uh, and, and outcomes that they, as planners, valued and that they sought to achieve in communities. And that generated a long list of communities and attributes, which I analyzed. Um, cities, about 150 different cities were named. Um, and then I tried to, I chose communities that were named multiple times and also to get a cross-section of, of communities. I decided to uh, study and write about eight communities uh, of different sizes and different types. The cities were Chattanooga, Tennessee, Charleston, South Carolina, Providence, Rhode Island, Madison, Wisconsin, Duluth, Minnesota, Wichita, Kansas, Westminster, Colorado, and San Diego, California. I made trips to each one of these places, um, conducted interviews with people who were familiar with those cities, who, many of which whom had participated in these planning processes, people who knew that community well and knew how these outcomes had happened and who participated. And I, I recorded, tape recorded all these interviews and then transcribed them. Um, and I, what I've done in this book is to write the stories about these places, the things that I saw firsthand, and the, the uh, stories that I was told by, by people. Uh, these are not detailed histories. I didn't spend my time in a library. I got a few books along the way and, and references, but mostly this was to study uh, what had really happened. I studied planning documents that had been uh, prepared, planning reports, correspondence. I've got uh, boxes and boxes of stuff from each one of these places. Um, the important thing, and this is the sort of the thing that distinguishes what I was trying to do from what a number of books that I've seen. I've seen a number of books that say, this is, these are good things that have happened. And they show pictures of different communities. And this is good, and this is good, and this is good. And it shows, actually, then they go and they say, this is bad, and this is bad, and this is bad. What I did was to show what people valued in these communities. They essentially valued it. And then I described how these things came about. It wasn't just what happened, but how. Uh, I also got then two contributed case studies from two people that I respect who I got to know in Massachusetts. They both been planning practitioners and have taught planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, Philip Hare and uh, Terry Zold. Uh, Phil Hare did a case study on Block Island, Rhode Island, and Terry did a, a, a story about Burlington, Massachusetts, uh, an edge city suburban community outside of Boston uh, where she was the planning director for a number of years. The stories are all very different from one another. Um, and that's the interesting thing that, to me in many ways. The, the problems addressed were different. Uh, the processes of planning were different. The roles that people played in planning, uh, the, the planners played were different. Um, in many ways this confirms what my own sense about what planning is all about uh, has been all along. Uh, my favorite definition of planning, the simplest I think, is one by Greg, Greg Lindsay who said, planning is a practical activity that is done in places to solve particular problems. That's fairly simple, which means it's, it is rooted in place, which is another way of saying to really understand the impact that planning has had and can have, it's important to understand the places where it's practiced to know a little bit more and to get a little bit into the, into the detail and, to, uh, and the storyline. So I'd like to now turn to Chattanooga, Tennessee. What I'm going to do is give you three little sketches, three sketches of three places, and I'm going to talk about some of the qualities that uh, planning has sought to achieve in, uh, in communities and to wrap up with a few uh, concluding observations. Chattanooga is one of the most amazing turnaround stories that, is, that I could imagine. Um, how many of you have been to Chattanooga or have, oh my goodness, okay, recently? Yes, and so are you, you're familiar with its transformation? Uh, is this a, a um, planning story that resonates for people? Yes, well, I didn't at the time know much about Chattanooga. Um, but it came up a lot in the surveys of planners, uh, and it obviously uh, had for many. And then there were stories in Planning Magazine. The story is, is dramatic in the sense that this was a city that, an industrial city, a working city, 
um, that in 1969 was declared to have the worst, the dirtiest air in the United States. Um, it's not the kind of thing that a chamber of commerce wants to put on a bumper sticker. You know, come to Chattanooga, we got dirty air. We've got the dirtiest air. Um, but it was a working city, and somehow, it, had, it, it had, all of its life, it had been called the Dynamo of Dixie, a major transportation corridor uh, through from uh, north to south. Railroads converged in the valley next to the river, surrounded by, by mountains. For many years, people just ignored the pollution and the contamination in the city. Um, Ann Coulter, who was the director of the RPA when I visited, talked about how the, the, the air was an orange haze and the sunsets were really brilliant. She thought they were beautiful. She grew up there. But she realized, in fact, this was not normal. Um, T.D. Harden, the longtime planning director of the RPA, talked about going to work in the daytime and having to have the headlights on because the, the uh, air was so, was so bad. People left the city. They went to the, the managers and the professional people, just abandoned it and went to the higher ground, built houses and settled in the higher, higher areas. But when that citation came, that really was a, a kind of a wake-up call. There was another wake-up call that the city got in 1980. The New York Times uh, wrote an article, a major article, which singled out Chattanooga as the only city in the South that wasn't growing. There was growth going on everywhere in the South. But Chattanooga was losing population and its job growth, although still positive, was falling behind other cities. Um, the article went on to talk about how a group known as the Civic Forum had commissioned a survey to find out why was it that Chattanooga was viewed as such an undesirable place, or why weren't people moving there, and why weren't businesses moving there. And the interesting thing is that this survey got back responses that didn't say anything about environmental contamination or air pollution. In fact, suggests to me that they were well on their way to licking that problem. They, and, and the storyline that I've been able to reconstruct is, in fact, they had started to work on that even before HEW cited them for having such uh, polluted air. What, they, what this survey revealed was, and what people told them is, you have no image. You have no identity. You're just a way station on the way to Atlanta and somewhere else. You're, you're a point on the highway. The interstates all converge, and people just uh, go, go through. Um, so Chattanoogans are great storytellers. I think this is one of the things that I loved about going. They are great storytellers, and, and they will give different spin about uh, how it was that they got mobilized and everything. There was one person who said, that, that being cited for having the worst air shamed them into doing something. And I don't know about the power of shame, but I do know that they galvanized as a community and began to address these issues in a very systematic way. And as I reconstruct the chronology, they started even before that citation in 69. Uh, T.D. Harden was hired as the planning director in, in Chattanooga in 1965. Up until then, they'd had a a planning agency, but it had, didn't have any professional, it had no, no professional staff. Um, in 1967 and 68, there was a plan that was developed called it Toward a Better Environment. It talked about environmental resources um, and the importance of, of uh, enhancing an appreciation and enjoyment of the scenic resources, of improving the, the views of the mountains, of uh, removing visual clutter and billboards, and it talked about the importance of relating the city to the river. Um, that concept of the city relating to the river was totally novel at the time. I talked to a professor of geography at the University of Tennessee, Ron Foresta, who said the area near the river was just a vacuum. There was nothing going on. People were just dumping debris there. Anyway, not long after that toward a better environment plan, uh, was released. Something very important happened. Uh, Mayor Kelly, who had hired T.D. Harden, got a sales tax measure passed, which got a fraction, I think it was a quarter, some percent of the sales tax increased, and that dedicated to the support of city and county agencies, including the regional planning agency, which was a shared agency between the city and the county. So that gave a stable source of, uh, of revenue. 
About in 1980, the, about the same time, a small urban design studio was established on Vine Street in a storefront by Stroud Watson, who was a professor of architecture and planning at the University of, uh, the School of Architecture and Planning at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. He got funding from the local Lindhurst Foundation that was this first injection of funding for some very novel and innovative creative uh, planning. And within a year, Watson and his students had preserved uh, produced an urban design structure plan for Chattanooga called Images of the City. The importance of this was that really the downtown had lost its whole structure. They had had de downtown department stores uh, which had left the downtown and gone out to the malls. So that what had been the center of the city was no longer the center of the city. This urban design structure plan redefined the structure of the city and redefined the multiple, uh, the centers and the nodes of the city. It basically identified three major nodes and a, and a linear structure going from the river with a node at the river, a new central point, and a south uh, node down at the Chattanooga uh, Choo Choo. Maybe I could have the, uh, uh, that transparency. This is a, uh, I'll just, uh, This just gives you a sense of the structure of Chattanooga um, as it is today. This massive structure here is the Tennessee Valley Authority offices, which uh, someone described to me as the, the biggest dam without water. And it has about 5,000 people in it. The location of that facility was also something that was heavily influenced by downtown, downtown planning. But the structure they, de they redefined was basically a, a spine going from the river, which you can see there's a triangular building there, which is the new Tennessee Aquarium, and then following down Broad Street, um, a, a, def, a, a new center at the angle, and coming down and off this picture is uh, where the Chattanooga Choo Choo is. Anyway, this planning process is, was rich and multi-layered. Um, one of the important things that happened in the, we can turn that off now, was that they began to try to generate ideas, to, uh, to really think creatively. And one of the things that they, they did was to uh, decide that they should go and, and visit some cities in, other, country, in uh, other parts of the country to see what they had done. They got about 50 or 60 people to make a series of intercity trips. Uh, the city planning director, T.D. Harden, went, the mayor, business community, uh, Hardin by that point had organized a leadership group uh, of business people, and I think this was really the nucleus that became the Civic Forum. Uh, but the first city that they went to visit was Indianapolis. Uh, at the time, Indianapolis had received a lot of attention for having made a major turnaround, and uh, one of the major uh, things that they came away with was the importance of this group called the Greater Indianapolis Progress uh, committee, which was the acronym named GYPSY. Um, and Mayor Hudnut at the time used this group of people to bounce ideas off, um, to, to propose things, to uh, ask for input, uh, to present problems, and to ask for uh, suggestions on what the city should do on various issues. So it was really a group that, it was more than a discussion group, it was a group that helped to filter ideas and to give input and recommendations. So the people who from Chattanooga who went to Indianapolis came away thinking they needed something like that group to generate ideas and to start discussing things and to have it be a sounding board. And that led to the formation of Chattanooga, Chattanooga Venture. Um, the mayor uh, of Chattanooga appointed a board composed of about 60 individuals, including labor representatives and corporate leaders. Ron Littlefield, AICP, uh, became the executive director of Chattanooga uh, Venture. Uh, in 1982, picking up on the recommendations of, the, of this uh, earlier plan, the beautification plan, and ideas which had been generated uh, uh, over the succeeding years, a planning task force was established to develop a plan for the river and an area called Mount Moccasin Bend. Uh, and it came up with a plan a year later calling for a public park system along 22 miles of the, t of the Tennessee River. Then the most pivotal, 
pivotal planning process occurred of all in 1984. Um, when I interviewed people in Chattanooga, every one of them talked about the Vision 2000 process as being an absolutely transforming event, one that helped people to reach agreement on some, th on some important uh, tasks for the future uh, and to discover, to set an agenda, an action agenda. And this was organized by that same group, Chattanooga Venture. Uh, it was really a marathon. It went over a period of six months, um, frequent meetings uh, focused on specific issues with trained facilitators, um, consultants like Gianni, Gianni Longo were, were brought in, uh, the city supported it, the, the planning staff, and people were challenged to think about the future. What could this city do to turn itself around? And what they came up with was not your conventional kind of heavy, ponderous, comprehensive plan, but was agreement on 40 specific items uh, of undertakings. And they put them together in what they called a commitment opportunity work workbook. It was a portfolio of commitments, of projects. And they identified various activities that could be undertaken. People uh, started to then go to work on these particular items. And as a result of this, um, a series of actions were undertaken. The, the idea of connecting the city to the river was confirmed. The idea arose of developing a freshwater aquarium and anchoring that as an attraction and a focal point for public activity and developing a node at the river's edge and connecting then the river to the, uh, the city to the river um, to restore the Walnut Street Bridge as a pedestrian bridge. Uh, and also a commitment to restore, to improve housing opportunities, to develop uh, the downtown and the city as a whole as a place to live and to strengthen neighborhoods. Um, in 1984, the financing of this urban design studio that Stroud Watson had, had started as a, uh, in a storefront was solidified and changed to include participation by the city and the county. It was essentially brought into the into the sphere of the, of, the, of, the, of the city and the county planning process. And the city uh, supported it with, with funding and staff was put, and then, so, so essentially the urban design studio, freestanding and uh, operating not in city hall or in a public building, but a public process continued to generate ideas and people referred to it as their idea factory. Uh, in the mid 1980s, then planning activity really picked up. The firm of Carl Lynch, was hired to develop a plan for now a 26 mile long river walk along the Tennessee River. Unfortunately, uh, Kevin Lynch died uh, about the time the contract was signed and Stephen Carr uh, carried it on with the rest of his firm. A new group called River City Company was formed to implement the Tennessee River Walk plan. An urban design study of the Miller Park District was completed. Now that is the, was the redefined center of the city. Um, Chattanooga Enter Neighborhood Enterprises was formed to develop affordable housing and expand housing in the city. And then things started to happen on the ground. We can maybe uh, go to the first slides, if we could. Oh, I'm sorry. So I just, uh, do I do the left one or the left? Okay. So this is downtown Chattanooga. The Chattanooga Times played a major part in promoting and covering the planning processes. Um, okay, is this? Okay. Just the industrial character of the city, the DuPont plant really an industrial city. This is a city that when you appreciate what it's done, you, to, know, uh, to know where it has come from, um, its industrial condition. Uh, vacant block uh, in the center of the city. But this is the new Tennessee Aquarium, a $45 million uh, undertaking with a mixture of public and private funding, with a uh, wonderful public plaza, visitor center, Uh, this is a, the uh, public plaza and park. There's housing that's been developed adjacent to it. 
encouraged the renovation of buildings adjacent. This is an old trolley barn adjacent to it. I was there in a, in a January, stayed in a residence inn, which was developed in a very tasteful way across from the, um, near the aquarium. Housing developed, and that's the Walnut Street Bridge, which is now the uh, uh, country's longest pedestrian bridge. Connects to uh, North Chattanooga and a, and a lively and a, uh, improving area of the city over there. The funding of the, of the bridge was, it, this was such an exciting project that there was great interest in helping it financially and uh, people contributed with these plates um, and had na their names dedicated on them. A very attractive walkway leading down to the river's edge from the Hunter Art Museum. And I don't know why this is not coming down. Okay, down along the river, below the bridge. The interesting thing is that a result, as a result of the planning processes, really Chattanooga has developed a sense uh, that its, its mission really is to develop itself as a model for sustainable development. And it's done that in a number of ways. One is by uh, developing a, an electric bus transportation system which operates buses from uh, along that spine that I described, uh, leaving every five minutes free bus service within the city, following the spine uh, of uh, Broad Street, past the, re the restored Tivoli Theater. That was one of the agenda items in the portfolio of commitments that was identified. Uh, this is the Reed House in the redefined center the Planning and Design Center in 1990 was relocated in a new place, the Miller Plaza and Miller Park area. This was the, as a result of this Miller Plaza urban uh, area plan. And that's really where a great deal of the planning now takes place. The facility is developed in a very open way with uh, space for putting up maps and, and for, for uh, public meetings and brainstorming sessions. Uh, and it's, it's kind of neutral territory. People refer to it as, as a much more open environment in which to conduct planning. The, uh, and the plan, there are also shops and restaurants in, and offices within that complex. The uh, Tennessee Valley Authority buildings, uh, quite an incredible monument, and the Chattanooga Choo Choo at the other end of the spine which has been renovated into a uh, hotel complex, and you can stay in one of the um, uh, rail cars as a, as a hotel accommodation, which is quite an unusual um, thing. Next to it, a transportation um, parking garage and also a uh, repair facility where they have exhibits that show the uh, manufacture and repair of these electric vehicles, which are uh, manufactured in Chattanooga. So it's a, it's a kind of a work in progress. What is really important and what really has happened is that the city's whole, that the sense of the, the direction of change has changed and the ability of the community to shape that change. Uh, there, is, there is an image for the city. It's not a city without an image. It sees this whole idea of, of being, of testing out ideas for sustainable development as its source of, uh, of its own development and, its, and marketing itself been a place that's marketed itself for those for environmental uh, conferences. It's looking for new ways to, uh, to do creative and environmentally uh, uh, positive development. Uh, the Chattanooga Institute's been founded. Uh, a non-waste generating industrial park is being developed. The regional planning agency is in the center of things. It is trying new things all the time. Uh, and the director of the, of the planning agency, as I said, uh, to one of the classes uh, is now able to go to the city council to say, we'd like to do a visioning exercise to uh, do in this particular area. They, for example, a very creative process for developing really a new town in town in the south side area. City council's very conservative. They're not, a, they're not people that like to spend money 
lightly, but they now believe in planning and they are willing to invest in it. The second success story I wanted to talk about is Westminster. Um, it is a community halfway between uh, Boulder and Denver. Uh, in many ways, it too had no clear image. It wasn't Denver, it wasn't a big city, and it wasn't the People's Republic of Boulder. Um, it was a city that had annexed a great deal of land, a lot of empty land. It was suburbanizing rapidly. It had no center. It had, no, it had some existing commercial development in the south. Um, there's Denver to the south from a high point on the southern end of the city. What Westminster began, one of the things that began it was when a university, Westminster College, was established there. And this was the first building. As it turned out, it was the only building. There was hope that this would become the Princeton of the West. But it didn't happen because there was no water. There, this, this is uh, the high uh, prairie, and uh, water is very scarce. And the shortage and poor quality of water, in fact, for Westminster was to po pose uh, increasing problems as the city grew. It's not possible to, to, to describe all the twists and turns, but essentially what the city did was to develop a competitive point system which awarded s water connections to developments that did the kinds of things the city wanted to see and that provided, for example, open space and recreational facilities. The first plan for the city of Westminster was a citywide recreation and open space plan. That was really, they had an idea of, of a developing an open space system that was very forward looking. And then they looked for developers to build green belts and walkways and trails that connected with that open space system. Because growth was so rapid at various times and so much more de development was occurring than uh, or developers were wanting to develop than, than could be service connections, it was very competitive. And the city had the position of being able to award which developments got the service connections. And as a result, you, ha you see some wonderful green spaces and walkways and trails that then connect with the rest of the city's open space system. Uh, along the way, uh, the city and the planners and the city manager convinced voters to approve a sales tax increase uh, of about a quarter percent that would go into a reserve fund to buy open space. And they did this while the city was growing in anticipation of its future growth and, it, and they now have an absolutely incredible open space system that runs through the, through the city. To do this in a, in a conservative climate, political climate, I think is absolutely um, remarkable. So now we have uh, an integrated open space system that weaves together the city and uh, different residential areas. It also serves as an alternative transportation system, a bike system of bike trails and walking trails uh, that weave through the city in a remarkable way. They uh, have planned this trail so system so it can go under major highways. Um, still though, the city had no center. Uh, they had a plan, uh, and uh, in developing the open space plan, they developed a city park, a very formal circular park. It was actually in the geographical uh, location area of the city, geographical center, and a recreation facility was built overlooking that city park, but still the city had no center. Uh, during the, the, uh, the city of Westminster, like that part of the country, has experienced a series of boom and busts. And the big bust that occurred in the 1980s provided the city with an opportunity. There, as you know about the Savings and Loan Association uh, crisis, where developers had basically uh, gone bankrupt, uh, bank, SNLs had uh, repossessed, had to repossess properties, and there, were, there was a kind of a going out of business sale, the city saw an opportunity to acquire a strategic piece of property adjacent to the city park. And, and really saw this and then having control of that to develop a plan for this area. They prepared a transportation plan that improved highway access to it. And so they had an idea about how they wanted to develop that and to try to create a city center. Then a developer came in uh, uh, who was wanting to develop a multi-screen movie complex. 
Uh, and it was a conventional suburban movie complex surrounded by acres of parking. And the city said no, they wouldn't approve it. The planning agency said no. But they didn't just say no, they said, well, let's help think about this now. We've got this land that's adjacent over here that we'd like to have some things happen. And we really think that you could do something much more exciting with this and connect it, link it with some other uses. Um, and uh, they, took, they went on some trips with this developer to West Coast cities to see some larger complexes where movie and entertainment complexes were intermixed with um, other kinds of uh, commercial and recreational amenities. So they raised the developer's sites. They just didn't sit back and wait and hope that something good would happen. Uh, the city's Department of Community Development was given money to hire an architectural and planning firm to develop a master plan for the area that could be the template for this movie complex and, be, and make a much larger development. The concept that came up, that the city came up with, with their consultants was for a pedestrian plaza lined with shops and restaurants and offices, uh, a kind of an armature with the movie complex at one end, a convention center hotel, a conference center at the other end, a three-sheet ice arena in the, about the middle and linked then with shops and restaurants and plazas and, and fountains. A city center in the center of the city overlooking the city park connected with the city's open space system that ran diagonally through the length of the city. Um, the developer bought that as a, as a concept and development of that is now underway. I don't really have the completed slides uh, the completed pictures. They did build a highway through the property, depressed it so as to maintain a pedestrian connection. Uh, work began. The uh, movie complex has been developed. Uh, shops have come in. The Weston, there's a Weston hotel that has now just opened. Uh, but it is beginning to develop a sense of an urban landscape, uh, uh, some focal point for uh, public celebrations for recreation, an orientation point in the city that really didn't have a center. And I'm convinced that uh, as, future unfo as time unfolds that this will actually become quite a lively place. This is the uh, uh, ice arena uh, that was developed by the uh, county recreation uh, department and a series of activities linking. One of the things that planning does is it makes connections. It knits a community together it avoids the, the kind of isolation. Um, the last project in Westminster that I'd like to uh, tell about uh, is a project which was happening on the doorstep of the city hall complex. Now this is a city that was trying to create an identity and an image for itself. Um, and it worked very hard in, in developing a municipal complex that tried to communicate that. It developed uh, a very modern building they developed a logo and an image that they, you saw that on the open space marker, marking the land that had been acquired by open space. But they developed a campanile adjacent to this complex uh, that kind of makes a reference to Westminster in, in England. Anyway, right in the, basically in the front yard, diagonally across, a developer wanted to put a big box development, a series of 50,000 square foot big box pads and line them in a row for a quarter mile straight. And that was what he was going to put in the front yard of the, um, of the city's uh, new municipal complex. This is just off the uh, Denver Boulder Turnpike. There's an exit where you come into the city at that point. Uh, so it's a very imageable, it's a, it makes a, an impression when you come into the city at that particular point. There's a lot of temptation in places like Colorado and cities like Westminster to approve development because they get collect the sales tax revenue that's collected from commercial development. It's actually a kind of a corrupting municipal finance mechanism because it encourages a lot of approval of a lot of commercial development that shouldn't probably be happening. But they said no to this development and they, they, and they took their chances. They said, look, this is not what we, what we wanted to have. Um, but again, they didn't just say no, they took a proactive approach and they decided to say, okay, 
we're not just going to leave it to you to figure out maybe what we'd approve. We're going to work with you to come up with a plan that we think will work. And so, again, the city invested in planning, gave the city's planning department money to hire their own architect, planner, site planner, to develop a site plan concept for this particular property. Um, and maybe what I will go to the transparencies, and what I will do is I guess I will shift from, I'll just do the transparencies, and then I'll talk about the lessons that have come from this and, and uh, leave a little time for questions. What they came up with was a, con let's just bring this upper right, this is the one that I really want to focus on. Um, the site plan, this shows the, the site uh, principal intersection just off the exit for the Denver Boulder Turnpike. The municipal complex is right up in the upper right. The site butted up to housing. So there, was, there were residents, uh, dense multifamily development in behind. This is the site that the developer was wanting to develop. What the site plan and the plan that the city came up with was to basically try to make some reference to the street, to hold the line of the street, to anchor the entrances, frame the entrances with buildings, uh, very lush landscaping, to, and to create two major openings uh, to connect with the residential areas and to stagger the frontage uh, and with very wide sidewalks uh, connecting to it. The other important thing was that they spent as much time in designing the rear of this complex as they did the front. Uh, this was four-sided architecture. And they really go to the transparency, the next one. Um, the developer, in, in thinking about this, he was, first of all, he was absolutely angry when he was turned down. And then he got scared because he had a lot of money in this. And then, as he told me, and I'm, I will quote his words, he said, I began to listen. He began to open up, to think about some possibilities. And John Carpenter showed him slides of uh, Country Club Plaza in Kansas City and started to think about it, and, and the architect working on it uh, uh, started to make some ideas. What could we make some reference that would be uh, geographically appropriate in architecture? And the, the idea of the architecture of the campus at, at Boulder came up, but also of Italian Hill uh, towns and architecture. They encouraged the developer to hire a new architect who worked with the city's architect planner. And they came up with an, a, a, a way of treating this as a kind of a, an urban landscape. This is a, this is, these are big box uh, developments that have been scaled down slightly in size. But they've been s sort of staggered back and forth um, with very wonderful um, architectural details and mosaics and fountains. Uh, maybe I could have the next. This is, the, this is the kind of landscape, this is the treatment of the front of the building. It encourages people to walk from one store to another, which is unheard of in a big box development. And people walk from store to store. As a result, the sales in this development are higher than any other uh, commercial development in Colorado. Uh, okay, the next. But you can see the kind of treatment that, uh, that went into this, what could have been a very conventional kind of development. Uh, the way in which this makes then a reference to the city campanile and the municipal complex in the back. Okay, the next. Um, and to make it even more special, there was, a, again, like Country Club Plaza, there was a big fountain that was put in at the corner. That's at the major intersection. So it's one of the first things you see when you come to this area that tells you this is something special. This, this place is really different. And then the last, uh, the last one shows the relationship of that to the Campanile. This is, these are, it's a picture that I took. Um, but it's an unusual development. The city, then when they developed a plan, this was going to cost a lot more money than the developer had wanted to spend. And so this, the attitude of the city, and this is going to not, this would knock people out, I think, in some parts of the Midwest. The city said, okay, we'll put some money into this project. We've got to live with it. And so they did a sales tax rebate agreement where they agreed to rebate a set amount of the sales tax revenue that they were going to collect from this development for the first three years. They thought it was going to take three years. It only took a year and a half. 
and now it's pure gravy. And they've created a shopping complex which has really put them on the map. And it's, it's profitable. It's, in fact, more profitable than anybody could have, could have dreamed. So uh, they invested in themselves uh, and created a very special place. I really don't have time to talk about Duluth, which was a major example. Um, let me just uh, end by showing, talking about some of the things that um, Actually, maybe I could, we could try those slides. Let me see where I am here. I'll see if I can, can rest through. Could you advance the slide projector to, a, is there an opening there? Is there a space? Susan? Yeah. Okay, the next, is there another space? Can you, can you advance it? Is there a, okay. I'm going to, I'm just going to run through here. <laughs> this is San Diego, uh, just to show that people who engage in planning have some, uh, can still allow some freedom. This is actually a house in downtown San Diego. It's uh, an incredible place. And um, and this is also Southern California, certainly gives you a feeling of uh, of uh, free spiritedness, but San Diego is a place that really did some wonderful planning. What, the, what I've learned uh, from these outcomes is that planning is about place making. It's about making places special, places that people appreciate and just enjoy being in. And this is the children's park. This is a park area in downtown San Diego. Really a, a remarkable a beautiful spot, and walkways along the uh, along the uh, the water. Planning has created places and landmarks and institutions that people can be proud of, uh, such as Monona Terrace in Madison. A remarkable project that, in fact, was the process of of probably 60 years of planning. Monona Terrace was conceived of by Frank Lloyd Wright and kept being revived and modified and, uh, and through the diligence of the planning director in, in Madison came to, came to pass. When you stand on the deck on the top of this, of Monona Terrace looking out at the lake, it's like being on ocean liner. It's, it's really quite a remarkable way to connect to the lake. And it m connects on the axis to the capital which was defined uh, in the original duty plan of Madison and then reinforced by the 1911 John Nolan plan. So it really relates. It's, as Paul Soglin, the mayor said, it's a building that could only be in Madison. It couldn't be anywhere else. Um, and likewise, uh, the Century II complex in Wichita, Kansas, which uh, was designed and planned by a disciple of Frank Lloyd Wright. Exploration Place is a project, another landmark project in Wichita, Kansas. The architect chosen after a national search was Moshe Safdi. It's part of a river walk plan in that city on the Little Arkansas River. Um, Wichita has done a great deal to make use of the environmental resources and qualities that it has. And that is going to be a knockout facility, I'm sure. Planning has created places where people can come together uh, and enjoy themselves in collective activities um, and, and made people happy. It's provided places for gatherings. This is actually downtown Providence, which had been divided and cut through by rail tr tracks that you can see 
that arc around the, the middle of the picture have always been a division and then underutilized rail yards and, uh, and warehouse areas, not development. Highways scarred the, <clears throat> the downtown. This was a, a place that was fondly called Suicide Circle with a, uh, a veterans monument in the center. The area was transformed through a, a capital district plan that opened up the rivers, uncovered the rivers to create an, a recreational amenity, a series of walkways, and a space that has pedestrianized the downtown, has created a, an, an atmosphere that has just transformed the city. It's a, it's a very rich story. The highways were brought along the one side of the river when they opened it up and the, and the um, left side that you see there has been left for pedestrian activity. So this is a, this is a space that is a gathering place. I was there in the summer uh, for an event that was called Water Fire, where some local artist sets uh, logs burning in the, in the, along the rivers and, and there's music and there are tens of thousands of people who are watching this, this spectacle. You can see the, the pods are along the river there. This is the, this is the space. This has created a place that people gravitate to. And that's water fire at night. So when planning makes special places, it, it builds people's attachment to places. Uh, planning has strengthened the centers of communities, uh, like in San Diego. The Horton Plaza complex uh, is often written about in books. It's a fantastic space. It's a wonderful piece of architecture. Uh, but it actually was part of a plan, and I just want to kind of underscore in running through these slides, the various elements. It was part of a comprehensive plan for the downtown of San Diego, because it wasn't just Horton Plaza. Other retail projects in downtowns have not worked. The architecture helped. It's a fantastic um, a complex with uh, wonderful architectural details. <clears throat> but it was only one element. The San Diego trolley was the other part. The Metropolitan Development Transportation Board was really a planning agency working with the city in thinking about coordinating transportation and land use. And the, and the trolley was a big part of the development strategy for the downtown. And running the, the trolley through the downtown with various connections <clears throat> energized the, uh, the development of the city. And then it had to be a city that people lived in. They built housing. The plan called for over 5,000 new units of housing uh, that was built along the trolley line. You can see the red trolley there running along the city around the, uh, the spine. A whole mixture of housing types they also developed uh, single room occupancy homes, uh, mixed income, low income housing, but made the downtown a place to live. So, and connected to Horton Plaza, a supermarket. So people have a place to shop, Ralph's supermarket. And the shopping, the parking is underground, underneath this complex, so it's not an ordinary um, suburban style development. Uh, Wichita developed its center with a complex uh, addition to their convention center and hotel related to the river. So strengthening the centers of cities is one of the things that planning has clearly done. And this is Wichita, the market, old town area. OK, we, could we put the other one on? I'll just talk about some of the other things. Planning has made connections between uh, parts of the city, made communities whole. Uh, the uh, trails and open spaces of, in Westminster have knit the city together. Can we? Okay, planning has encouraged compact development. This is a site that was an old Sears store in San Diego. The planning agency acquired it as a redevelopment site, developed a plan for it in a mixed use concept, developing housing uh, on a major portion of the site, 
with uh, very nice scale, narrow streets and walkways. The important thing, the planning agency, the city, developed the plan for this and then found a developer to uh, construct it. Connecting to a series of shops, uh, this, is, this is classic mixed-use development, compact development on a site with a shopping center, a supermarket in the center. Offices and uh, restaurants, community center, a real little village in the center of the city. This is a kind of, this is an infill project that was done on a municipal, municipal property in Madison, Wisconsin. It's the kind of thing you could drive by and never notice. But it was, it happened because the city wanted to develop uh, mixed use development that was complementary. This was a corner abutting a residential area but on a commercial street. So I had commercial on the first floor and housing above. Planning has knit communities together, made connections. This is a pedestrian bridge, that compact development that I showed you, the Sears site, with housing and shopping, was on one side of a freeway. The other side was a low-income neighborhood. Uh, and plan, the, as part of the plan, they said, Let's, we've got to connect this so that people on the other side of the freeway can get there. So as part of the plan, a pedestrian bridge was built over this uh, highway. Something very, very simple, just thinking how to improve access and allow people to take advantage of, of something. This is a wonderful element. There were some there were, uh, sayings all along here. You must do that which you think you cannot do. And just one simple, and I'll close with the slides here. This is a simple kind of thing in Westminster, a shopping plaza in the Northport section of the city one of the common, one of the things about SPA, we think about uh, low density development and vast s spatial separations, but one of the things about SPA is the way uses develop without relating to their neighboring uses. And a typical form of shopping center development in suburban areas is to have, to front on a main street and just put a, hollow, a solid back to the other. And planners, when they, in, in, Mad in uh, Westminster, w there was a, a residential area behind this shopping center. And one of the simple things that they insisted was that there be an opening at the corner of the shopping center so people, residents of the neighboring housing, could walk to the shopping center more easily instead of having to go all the way around, all the way down to the end and, and come in the front in a kind of an un, uncivil way. Well, there's much more, um, and this has sort of been a dry run of my attempt to try to give you a sense of what planning has done. Let me just run through some of the final points. It's created environments that have encouraged pedestrian activity. It has encouraged uh, transportation alternatives to the automobile, strengthened public transit, and I've shown examples of all of those in, uh, in these specific ideas. It's put out big ideas, grand ideas, um, that have captured the imagination of communities. It's preserved historic resources and environmental resources and made communities more livable. It's been mindful of equity issues. It's not been exclusionary. It has included low and moderate income housing. It has realized that planning must uh, create benefits for all the people in the community. And Charleston and San Diego and Chattanooga have been leaders in the development of affordable housing. It, and, and it has strengthened local economies in all of these places. One of, one of the most poignant in Duluth, a city that has shrunk in size, um, is a city that's lost jobs. And the pressure on economic development has been tremendous. And the mayor came in and said, we've got to have economic development, by which he meant we'd, we shouldn't have any standards. We shouldn't say no to anything. But experience has shown from the things in, in cities like uh, Duluth that Building a better community, better environment, and being willing to say no occasionally is the way to build up the qualities that attract businesses today, that make people want to live in them. Um, a guy driving through Duluth went through and saw the things that had happened in that city and said, I'd like to locate my business there. And so he moved his aircraft design and manufacturing business there. One very important thing is the ability to say no. Um, it's important when you know where you want to go. 
when you have an idea about what is appropriate. What, what is your sense of place? And I'll just give you one example of that uh, from Duluth. They developed, and I, I have slides which I didn't have a chance to show, of the waterfront development that came as a result of a vision process that was, happened in 1984. And they've developed a wonderful waterfront area, a lake walk, that has reconnected this, to the city to the lake. And there's great pride now in its maritime heritage, Great Lakes heritage. They have a, they brought a Great Lakes freighter, freighter that they've restored and have put, it's tied up down there, the, the uh, U.S. Steel uh, freighter. Well, the governor of Minnesota, Arne Carlson, at one point, and this was told to me by a member of the Planning Commission uh, uh, in Duluth, said, he came up with this idea, didn't know where, but he heard about this old battleship or destroyer, the USS Des Moines. So why don't we, t maybe, I mean, Duluth would like the Des Moines, wouldn't they? And they could tie it up there, and they could, it could be an attraction. And, um, and this is this, after the city had gone through this visioning process, and they knew that what was really special about Duluth was its Great Lakes heritage. Well, what the heck did the Des Moines have to do with Duluth? It wasn't a Great Lake freighter. It wasn't named after Duluth. It had no connection whatsoever. And the interesting thing is they have a, they have a, a, a mechanism now that people have been educated to planning in Duluth. And there's a mechanism that people can appeal, petitions can be filed to overturn city council zoning actions if you get so many signatures. And now there's petitions all the time. And the, and the city was, the city fathers, city council said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'd, we'd like to have, have the Des Moines. But they had a vote on it. And the newspaper covered these things, and it became quite a debate. And the, the citizens said, no, we don't need the Des Moines. We're doing, we're doing OK. We know who we are. Thanks a lot, Governor. And that's tough to say no to the governor. You know, the governor controls a lot of purse strings. But it, I think it was a step of pride and a sense that they, they had come a long way. They knew what planning was all about. Um, so there are some great stories out there. They often involve many different people. It isn't just one person. Uh, my own sense uh, from doing this has been to have been enriched in my respect for people who have worked in those communities and have struggled and have taken the criticisms and had the courage to stand up and say what they're for and to take some risks and to, in, and to invest in these long-term efforts. Many of these have taken 10, 15, 20 years to bear fruit. Uh, and the people who have done that have, uh, have my admiration. And, uh, and that, I hope, will uh, help to spread a, a bit of the message. The things that have happened in the places that I saw have not happened by accident. Uh, and I want to thank you for having a chance to present some of this. It will be all in bound form in the, in the spring. And I'm sorry that I overdid the, the time and I just had too many success stories to tell you about. <laughs>